You are listening to Christian America Ministries on shortwave radio, broadcasting on frequency 7490 every Friday at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Christian America Ministries is dedicated to uncensored, politically incorrect biblical teaching. Christian America Ministries' main mission is to proclaim and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and His kingdom here on this earth, and revealing to the Anglo-Saxon and kindred people their true biblical identity as God's covenant people, Israel, and their responsibility today in the earth. If you would like to learn more about Christian America Ministries, you can visit our website, ChristianAmericaMinistries.org, or check out our YouTube YouTube channel and Bitchu channel for our weekly videos. And now the broadcast. Greetings in the blessed holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. This is Christian America Ministries Worldwide. We're broadcasting on WBCQ out of Monticello, Maine on frequency 7490. We're also broadcasting over the internet on YouTube at Christian America Ministries YouTube channel. Drops at the same time this broadcast does on shortwave, and it is also dropping on KingdomRadioOnline.com. So there's several ways to listen to us live, and uh, wherever you're listening, I'm thankful that you are tuning in. If you're listening to us on shortwave, uh, go to our website, ChristianAmericaMinistries.org, and reach out to us. Let us know where you're at and how you're listening. It would be a great help. Okay. In this broadcast, I'll go ahead and give a warning. This is going to be a very controversial subject. In fact, in a way, or not even in a way, it is going to be an R-rated program. So if you have any children uh, listening, I would recommend you to uh, have them leave the room. This is a subject that is going to be uh, quite offensive to some, but it is a doctrine that uh, we have to address. I've had a lot of people... Oh, uh, ask me to touch on this subject, and I don't want to do a 10-part series on the subject, so there's been more people write books on it and do series, and I just, at this moment in time, I don't uh, see it important enough to dedicate so many hours and many hours of touching on the subject, but we're going to do a broadcast on it, and maybe we'll even do a follow-up as well, but um, we're going to be talking about the serpent Cain Satanic Seed Line Doctrine. It goes by several names. Some people call it the Serpent Seed, the Dual Seed, the Two Seed Line Doctrine, the Cain Seed Line Doctrine. Um, and it is a subject that has, uh, it's a doctrine that's been around for quite some time. It is not something new. Um, it is not something new at all. But uh, it creeps back up in certain uh, groups over time. And some of you may be wondering, what in the world is that? Well, it is the belief that the sin in the garden was that of physical sex between Eve and a cosmic fallen angel named Satan, or some say it was some other angelic being. Or And the result of this sexual, sexual intercourse between this angelic figure and Eve is a half-angelic, half-man, demigod hybrid that was named Cain. The Cain, uh, the son of Adam and Eve, was actually, in the, this doctrine, was actually the son of Satan and Eve, and Cain's physical descendants are still among us today, is how the doctrine goes, and that these demigods are still among us, they're walking the earth, and they are that Cain seed, they're that satanic seed. And uh, the belief is that the fruit that Eve ate or partook of was actually physical sex. That was the act, um, that fruit. And the tree of knowledge and good and evil was actually the serpent. So it's, it's kind of complicated, but the serpent offered an allegory, physical sex to Eve by mentioning the fruit. And then Eve partook of the fruit, which was actually sexual relations with the serpent in this doctrine. And this serpent was actually an allegory for Satan, or like I said, sometimes it's some other angelic being. And this being had physical, um, physical sex organs, male sex organs, and he implanted Eve with his physical angelic seed, and the offspring was Cain. 
And Cain's, another thing that happened is Cain's descendants survived the flood. Whether you believe in a worldwide or local flood, um, it kind of matters if they survive the flood. Um, so huh, that, uh, that's kind of how it goes. Now, another reason I wanted to do this topic in this program is because many critics to the Anglo-Israel message often think that anyone who believes the Anglo-Israel message that the Anglo-Saxon and kindred people are Israel, also believe in this doctrine, which is absolutely, utterly false. There have been a select minority who have propagated and believed this doctrine that believed Anglo-Israel as well, but it is a minority, not a majority, um, and we can talk about that maybe in another broadcast. But that is why I want to. Uh, I do not adhere to this belief. Uh, I do not believe it is scripturally accurate, and I will give a warning that we are not only going to be, we're not going to even get close to scratching the surface of being able to discuss this doctrine because it is rather deep. It's a big rabbit hole. Um, and to discuss this topic, I have invited Paul Matrigine from Tearing Down Idols YouTube channel. You may be familiar with him to come on and discuss this project, or this not project, but this uh, doctrine with me. So, Paul, uh, what are your thoughts real quick on this doctrine before we get into Genesis 3 and some of the other things surrounding it? Well, no doubt it's a very interesting uh, doctrine for sure. Um, my first thought on it when I, when I first learned of it years ago was that it opens up, like, like you described it, a rabbit hole. A lot of rabbit holes come about as a result of that. Um, and it comes down to us deciding ultimately one major thing. Um, one, the, the one major thing is what is the source of evil? Mm -hmm. um, and we need to determine that. Is, it, is evil the source of uh, a supernatural being named Satan? Or is it from us? And that's the basic conflict we're looking at here, ultimately. And I doubt we'll get into all that. Scripturally speaking, my thought is, um, hermeneutically, it leaves a lot to be desired. And uh, that's, hopeful, as I understand it, that's what we're going to be discussing today, is the hermeneutics involved um, and the, the Bible interpretation involved in coming to this conclusion, which makes for a very interesting discussion, I think. Indeed. And those listening, like I said, there's going to be some that know exactly what I'm talking about. Others may have never heard of this before, and it may seem absolutely ludicrous. And um, there is an entire doctrine built on this. I mean, I, I have some books in my library that are well over four or 500 pages long de dedicated to this subject. And I'm going to quote uh, a couple of them here in a minute to show you kind of how the, their doctrine, what they really believe. And uh, like I said, we're not going to be able to scratch the surface on this subject, but it, uh, there, it is not a, it's not a new doctrine. It's something that's been around for a while. Um, but before we, we read Genesis 3, which is mainly where we're going to stay for the rest of this broadcast, I want to quote a few pro dual seed line books to give you a full understanding, or at least a, uh, that way you understand when I say that these people believe that Eve and this angelic cosmic being, Satan, had physical relations and Cain was the offspring. That is exactly what, I'm, what I mean. I'm not even, not allegorial, but I am physically, I'm talking about the physical union. There's nothing, nothing spiritual about it, not in that sense. So the first book that I want to quote is uh, The Two Seeds of Genesis 3.15, which is a 400-page book on the subject. And it says this on page 76, quote, food is another interesting word and comes from uh, 3978 in the Hebrew, see Strong's Concordance under 3976 and 398. The interesting thing about the use of this word in the Hebrew is that it comes from the same root meaning 389 as the word eat. In this sense, usage of food in Genesis 3, 6 is uh, united in the meaning of eat, which is linked to the meaning of lay, L-A-Y. The food 
of this tree of knowledge of good and evil was illicit sexual involvement with Satan. End quote. Now, before I go on to the, another, uh, the next quote, I am not attacking these authors personally. Um, I'm just quoting from their book on what they say they believe. Um, the next one is going to be called The Apple Story. That's the title of the book, The War Between the Children of Light and the Children of Darkness, on page 56, uh, which this b entire book was written as a rebuttal to other Anglo-Israel ministers who opposed this doctrine, the entire book. It says this on page 56, quote, We shall prove that the word of Yahweh is strong evidence that Eve was seduced sexually and conceived Eve, end quote. The next one is on page 68 of the book titled New Light on the Plan of the Ages, which was written in 1938, said this concerning the seed line doctrine. Quote, Eat Ave partook first. She ate with the serpent. The result of this eating or partaking tainted her being with the vital magnetism of an alien breed and so corrupted her life fluids that when she had children, the first one was the mental image of the serpent. The water of life became the wine of death. And then the author goes on to say the same thing on the, or on the same page, says, quote, Thus we read that Eve ate with the serpent. It is a euphemism way of saying she had intercourse with the serpent, and Cain may very well be her son or his son. Last one is a book titled Identity and Destiny, Gnosticism and the New World Order, published by a church or something they call a church called the Church of Jesus Christ Gnostic. And on page 200 it says this, When the serpent seduced the woman, he was an adulterer, and the woman became a harlot, and therefore their offspring would truly be the seed of the adulterer and harlot and children of transgression. Okay, so you all understand when I say this, that's what we're talking about. Paul, uh, would you mind uh, reading the uh, Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 15 for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said... You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And, Paul, I mean, from your your experience, the majority of the, uh, other than other verses outside of this chapter, the majority of the seed line doctrine origin 
the scriptures that they use are right here in Genesis 3. In fact, many of them use Genesis 3.15 as their base text. Is that not correct? Almost exclusively. So let's kind of break this down a little bit. Like I said at the beginning, we're going to just stay in Genesis 3 for the most part. Um, so in order for the fruit to be sexual, to be actual physical sex, the tree of knowledge of good and evil would have to be a being, right? Absolutely. Okay. So the way the argument goes is these trees in the garden are actual physical beings, that the garden was populated with uh, beings, um, and these trees, all the trees were actual um, different types of beings. I don't know if they were pre-Adamic. The funny thing is, is when we get into this, there's several different interpretations. There's interpretations that say that Satan was the father of Cain, and they had sexual intercourse, and there's other interpretations where it was a other angelic being. There's another interpretation that it was a pre-Adamite, and then there and then there's other interpretations that it was actually a black man. You know, all kinds of different interpretations on what this is. But the majority is Satan had physical sex with Eve, and that these other trees, because in order to have the tree of knowledge of good and evil to be a person, all the other trees have to as well. And one of the verses that they use to justify this is Ezekiel chapter 31. And those listening, if they want to turn there, Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 8. And it says here, The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. And then if we want to drop down to verse 18 of that same chapter, and it says this, To whom art thou thus like a glory and a greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shall thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them, be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh, and all his multitude saith the Lord God. Paul, what is your your thoughts on that passage? Is this giving permission for us to think that all the trees in the Garden of Eden are actually people? I would seriously doubt it, especially if we're using uh, this passage in Ezekiel, because if we look at the biblical application of trees throughout the Bible, um, and I, I don't want to get into the details of the symbolism of mm -hmm. trees in the Bible, but basically we see Pharaoh being described as a tree, and he was a great king. We're talking about kingdoms. We're talking about basically um, the, the growth and expansion of an ideology or culture, perhaps you could say. Um, same thing with Nebuchadnezzar. God used mm -hmm. that same imagery as well to describe Nebuchadnezzar. If we're looking at trees as being a person, that presents some problems because if God said, do not partake of this tree, but you can partake of all these other trees, then essentially what God was saying is, look, you can have a sexual free-for-all with all <laughs> these other uh, peoples. And by the way, he's speaking to Adam. He's speaking to Eve, who are married, their husband and wife, right? So um, they'd have to be, in order to be consistent with this idea that trees equal people, is that basically God made Adam, Adam and Eve to be swingers. Mm -hmm. Except for this, with this one quote-unquote tree. That presents some serious problems for uh, presenting a God who is consistent with his law and who hates adultery. That would be my first objection to, to that thought. Well, you know, in this passage here in Ezekiel, it seems pretty clear we're talking about an allegory here for Pharaoh right. and Egypt and the, the enemies that envied Egypt. And the Garden of God is obviously symbolic too. And not talking about it literally because Egypt and Pharaoh have nothing to do with the, the literal Garden of Eden. 
Right. And they didn't even exist at that time. No, they did not. So we have here a an allegory being used. Right. And we see trees being used all throughout the Bible. Same thing with mountains to right. mean nations. And, uh, for example, in the Gospels, we won't turn there, but was not the mustard seed used for the kingdom of God? Kingdom. And what, is a, what does a mustard seed turn into? It turns into a mustard tree. Right. And uh, are we to think that was a physical being that you could have sex with too? <laughs> Now, another thing that you know, many people don't, even those that adhere to this doctrine, they don't really think about, and actually a lot of times they try hermeneutically, if the tree that Eve partook of was a physical person and the fruit was physical sex, so Eve had sexual relations with Satan or this being, then verse 6 would imply that also Adam partook of this fruit and had sodomite homosexual relations with Satan. Now let's read verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, this is Genesis 3, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she partook, or she, excuse me, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So, I, I hate to bombard my audience with this perverted sexual act, but let's let's just break it down here. Eve was seduced by this satanic angelic being to have physical sex with him in front of her husband, it sounds like. So he sat here and watched this angelic being impregnate his wife right in front of him. And then when... He is done impregnating his wife. We are, hermeneutically, we have to also come to the connection that he partook of homosexual sodomy with this satanic being. No way around it. Now, I have heard that try to explain away, and I don't know how you can explain that away if you think that Eve partook sexually. How can Adam not partake of sexual, sexually as well? I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Paul? I, I honestly don't see how you can interpret it any other way unless you're going to further rest the scriptures to say something else. Um, one of the things that's very, very, I guess, uh, unsettling about this doctrine is the preponderant emphasis on, on sex, um, which is very, very much unlike the Bible in general, really. Um, and to take this and to interpret it as the sexual act is to read into it something that simply cannot be sound hermeneutically soundly read into it. Another thought on this too, and this is important in my opinion anyway, is that if Eve partook of this fruit, i.e. sexual intercourse, with the serpent, and by the way, I thought it was kind of interesting that she ate with the serpent, even though nowhere in Scripture does it say that the serpent ate as well. It just says that she ate mm -hmm. um, and her husband ate. But that means that she committed adultery against Adam, right? And we know that from Deuteronomy 24, if a woman goes to another man, she can't return to her husband because according to Jeremiah 3.1, the land would be defiled. It's an abomination in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think given our understanding of such things as telegony, which would be worth your audience's time to look up, mm -hmm. um, that would mean that she has been defiled. That's why uh, David in 2 Samuel 20 never touched his concubines after they'd been defiled by Absalom because they were no longer, according to God's law, touchable. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a corrupted relationship between Adam and Eve from that point forward, which means um, Seth's line was a result of corruption, which means Christ himself was a result of corruption, which means we are a result of corruption. And that would belie the verse in Genesis 6, I think 6, 9 or 10, somewhere in there, where it says that Noah was perfect in his generations. In other words, he was genetically pure. So uh, there's a huge problem that comes about as a result of that, it means that Christ was of an impure lineage. 
And if he was to be our perfect Passover lamb, that could not be the case. So th- all this going all the way back to, to Adam and Eve, we end up with Adam being a sodomite. We end up with their lineage being corrupted from that day to this. Um, it's, a, it's a huge problem for those who want to say that, yes, Adam and Eve had this, had this relationship, but we are pure. It doesn't work. Adam being the sodomite, which would affect him genetically, and Eve being a harlot, essentially, which would affect her genetically. It's it's a lot of it's a lot to take in. Indeed. Um, and so we we have to deal with this. If we have to, if we're going to hermeneutically interpret it this way, we need to be able to deal with these things. And that just it's just one more rabbit hole after another, another problem to overcome as we go on every time we take a turn there's another issue yeah and and a lot of people may think that uh, it's not that complicated those that may not be familiar with it but those that adhere to this they there is a million yeah buts and they'll pull from Mm -hmm. all different scriptures and it can get rather complicated that's why genesis 3 is really where we need to start I have one book in my hand. I actually quoted it previously. The title is The Two Seeds of Genesis 3.15. And uh, there is a chapter in here titled The Sin of Adam. And uh, I'm obviously not going to read the whole chapter, but the very first part of the, uh, the book, it says this. If the conjural act with Satan was the woman's sin, of what was Adam guilty? We must carefully consider several points. Adam remained in his state of glory and immortality when the serpent seduced Eve. Yet he knew what happened. He was not deceived, 1 Timothy 2.14. Adam willfully chose to set down from his glory and immortality because he loved the woman that God had given him. The two had become one flesh, Genesis 2.24. You cannot understand the position of Adam without knowing of the love relationship between the man and the woman. They were one flesh in Jesus Christ. Notice the wording in Genesis 3, 6. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Now, I want to stop right there. What they're trying to do, and the author's trying to do here, is say that the fruit that Eve partook is different than the fruit that Adam took. Hmm. Did you get that same uh, from what I read there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't think I've heard this angle before. Well, okay, so let's read Genesis 3, 6 again. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to eat, and the tree to be desire, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And here it goes. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So... The context here, the King James here, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So we're talking about the exact same fruit, the exact same sin. Now, I don't really want to get into what the fruit was because there's, I mean, this could be a physical fruit or it could be allegorial as well. It really doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that somehow, in at least this author's eyes, that the fruit could be that Adam took is different than Eve? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, he would be a sodomite if she physically was seduced by Satan and had physical relations. I don't see any way around it. Okay, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to understand, make sure, make sure I understand what he's saying here. So he's saying that Eve partook of the tree, and that was one act. But then when she gave to her husband, that was completely different as in he did not partake of the same fruit that she did? Correct. It was him basically giving in to his wife in a authorit- authoritative role, not him actually partaking of sexual actions with the same being that she did. So he was basically choosing the woman over God in, in that sense. And that is when he lost his, uh, according to the author, glory and immortality because it doesn't say he was deceived. It just said that the woman gave. Okay. And so if if eat means to have sexual relations, uh, and that was a sin that she committed with the serpent, but then it says here in verse six at the very end it says that he ate. 
then that would have in order to be hermeneutically consistent, you need to interpret that as being a sexual sin. In, right? Indeed. The author goes okay. on right after what we what I read here and where he quotes Genesis three six, it says here Encapsulated into this small phrase is enough truth to shake heaven and earth. Eve surrendered her body to Satan and experienced conjugal relations outside the marriage bond. Note that the woman ate of the tree apart and separate from her husband. Now, I don't know how he gets that. And how with whom did she eat? The woman was beguiled by Satan, and having been seduced in the spirit and soul, she surrendered her body to Satan, appearing as an angel of light. Now, we'll just stop there. Wow. We just read Genesis 3, um, 3, 6, and it clearly says, And she did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. I don't see how the event was separate. You need you need to do some real hermeneutical gymnastics to come up with this. I, wow. Okay. Um, I mean, when you have to when you have to go to this extent to make this verse say something. I mean, when anybody who reads this and looks at its grammatical wording. Um, there's no way you could possibly conclude that this was a completely different thing because it says she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband, and he ate. The logical conclusion is that she ate some, she gave some of the same to her husband. Um, how you can make it say – I mean, that's that's some major gymnastics. That's a new one on me, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I <laughs> – I mean, and I understand they're trying not to make uh, Adam to be a sodomite because, uh, you know, it's bad enough that we have this picture in our mind of some angelic being with uh, uh, sexual genitals, physical genitals. We now have him sodomizing, so sodomizing Adam. Right. But even if we work our way around this and make it sound like he never committed sodomy. It's Satan, still bad. We still have to deal with Deuteronomy 24. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, either, either way, it's an adulterous situation. Either way, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, now let's talk about the fruit. Oh, boy. Okay. So, trees being people, the way this works is the fruit has to be sexual intercourse. Um, that That's the whole point. How does that work, Paul? You know, you in Scripture, fruit is normally, when used in an allegorical sense, it's usually the product of sexual relations, right? You know, children are referred to as fruit and right. seed in that way. You know, things that, are, you know, the <laughs> it's the thing that comes after the planting, so to speak. Try to make this as, uh, as friendly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it PG as po yeah, as possible. Yeah, it, it's hard on this subject because this is a disgusting subject. So, what are your thoughts on fruit? How how does that make sense being actual sexual intercourse? Because it doesn't to me. Well, short answer: it doesn't. Um, if you're Cain going to, would be the fruit, right? Right, Cain would be the fruit. Um, consistently throughout Scripture, fruit is the product of an act. It, whether we're talking about wicked deeds or good deeds, they are the results. It's what you reap um, from what you sow. And so the, the sowing aspect would be the sexual act, as we supposedly uh, read in Genesis 3, if the dual seed line doctrine is correct. So why are we suddenly changing our Bible interpretation for this instance? to accommodate the idea that fruit equals uh, copulation. Um, it, it is not consistent, it is not hermeneutically consistent at all. If you're going to use something as an image for Scripture, you need to go through the Bible from front to back. God is consistent. He doesn't change. You need to be able to prove from a consistent use throughout Scripture that fruit equals the sexual act. And if Christ 
is the first fruits from the dead. Just as one example, you've got some serious explaining to do if fruit <laughs> equals sex. Well, Paul, it doesn't mean it in that passage. Oh, uh, okay, so we're going to change it. In, I, yep, exactly. <laughs> and the point, we have to be hermeneutically correct. For example, just like when it comes to Adam partaking of the same fruit as Eve, that it has to equal the same thing. It can't be, you know, well, that was different. Um, one book that I highly recommend, uh, it is called What About the Seed Line Doctrine? A Biblical e Examination and Explanation of the Cain Satanic Seed Line Doctrine by Charles A. Wiseman. Um, this book is no longer, well, actually it is in print. You can go to America's Promise Ministries. They, they sell a copy. Um, and you can I'll also leave a link below where you can read it online for free because the author is no longer alive. But he says this on page 9. It should be noted that eating from the same tree caused the sin of both Adam and Eve. Whatever Eve did with the tree, Adam did also. So if eating from it means Eve had sex with the serpent or Satan, one must also say that Adam had sex with the serpent. If this serpent was a male, then Adam must have engaged in sodomy, and to say Adam engaged in sex with another woman is 100% speculation. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And also, for those wondering, this man was an Anglo-Israel author as well. So uh, for those that think that all people that believe in the Anglo-Israel message believe in this doctrine. Um, okay, so let's talk about another elephant in the room. The tree of life. Okay, so we have in Genesis 2.16... God saying, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. <laughs> now that would mean that God is saying to Adam, of every tree of the garden thou may freely have sexual intercourse with any tree except this one. Right. Um, in giving the same command to Eve. I mean, just you can freely have sex with any tree that you would desire to. Well, in Genesis 3.23, it says this, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent for, uh, him forth from the garden of Eden, and to till the ground from hence he was taken. What do you think the tree of life was, Paul? What do you think God is literally saying here? Oh, we have to get this man out of here. He's having sex with everything now. We have to remove him from the garden because if he has sex with this tree, which there's a lot of speculations on what that tree could be, <laughs> uh, he'll, he'll live forever. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, maybe God created man to be like a succubus where he gets his life-giving energy from sexual relations. I don't, uh, the sarcasm aside. I know. I'm um, trying not to be sarcastic as well. <laughs> um, the, this, is, this is another problem. Um, the, the tree of life, if we are to and, – and God said you'd eat of it um, – earlier on so okay you know we're going to have sexual relations with whatever it is that this tree represents um it presents a serious problem because there has never been a point where someone has derived life for oneself from having sexual relations that's not how it works and we have no other example in scripture if we're going to use this as an example so if we're going to be hermeneutically sound, we need to try to find the scriptural – well, it's, it's toward the beginning of the Bible, so I can't say precedent – but uh, a, script, a continuing scriptural usage of this kind of verbiage. Obviously, that doesn't work. In fact, we're told that the tree of life exists in the New Jerusalem. So are we to take this to mean that Christians are going to have sexual relations with this tree for eternity? Um, I a deep I rabbit doubt. hole in it. It is, and and I doubt, I, I I doubt that any of the folks that hold to this doctrine would claim this. 
No, of course not. No, they would they would reject it. Right. Um, you have to be hermeneutically consistent, and and in, to, in order to reject it, then that means that you're not hermeneutically consistent. Yeah, it it presents a lot of problems. Um, and oh boy. <laughs> Ooh, well, for those listening, let's go. Let's go to Genesis chapter four. Let's right. look at uh, Genesis chapter four, and we're going to look at verse one. And uh, for those wondering, before we start, this verse um, is very clear in about any translation that you that you can get a hold of. The the Septuagint, modern translations, the King James, the Geneva, you name it. It says about the exact same thing in every translation. It, it does. It does. It says, it says the same thing. There may be a translation out there that is different, but I have not heard of it, and I've yet to find it. But Genesis 4.1. Now, before I go there, if Satan had sexual relations with Eve and implanted her with his seed, and she became pregnant, and the offspring of that seed is Cain, then Cain is the father or the son of the devil, so to speak. He is literally the son of the devil. He's half angelic being, half man. Right. Well, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 says this. And Adam knew Eve. Now, for those that don't know, knew here in the King James always means sexual relations. It, it, he is, it's saying here Adam had sexual relations with Eve, his right. wife. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, this is Eve speaking, I have gotten a man from the Lord. That word Lord there is the tetragrammaton, Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever way you use to pronounce it. She is saying, I have gotten a man from Yahweh. Now some people try to twist that and say that it means Baal or Baal or whatever. Um, but... No, it's clearly the tet tetragrammaton, the same Hebrew word used over 3,000 times in the rest of the Bible. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? How does that affect this doctrine? It, to me, it seems like that should shut the door, but it doesn't to a lot of people. The discussion should end right there. Um, I, I remember when I first mentioned this doctrine to my wife, it was the first thing she mentioned. Well, what about Genesis 4.1? And the discussion should end there. It's very mm -hmm. straightforward, very clear. I've even had adherents to this doctrine tell me that, well, it's not like it's not like women never lie about who's the father of their child. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, so there's that. from that context, Adam was there when it happened, or he? I mean, he. Right. Who was there? From to the lie context, to? he sat there and watched. Satan have sexual relations with his wife right in front of her, and then when she got done, he climbed on. Right. So who's she lying to here? Yeah. Um, I'd really like to know. Um, this is this is a very straightforward text. We see this throughout the Bible. Um, so and so knew his wife, and she conceived and bore so and so. And nobody takes this to mean that this child is the result of anybody but the person who knew her. Um, but this is the one case in the Bible where we're going to interpret this as meaning somehow that Cain was the result of sexual union with Satan prior to Adam knowing her. There, well, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. I well, was say there's a major logical problem. Genesis 4, 16 through 17 same same chapter, and it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the, the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. Mm -hmm. He had sexual relations with his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Absolutely. Are we to think, just a few verses down, that Cain somehow did not have intercourse with his wife and bear his son Enoch? Exactly. It's it, it, it's a resting of the scripture to say that it means anything other than what it says. And it's very straightforward, very plain. 
this is a cause and effect type deal. You know, Cain or Cain has relations with his wife and Enoch is born. So we go back to Genesis four, verse one, Adam has relations or knows his wife, Eve, and she gives birth to Cain. It's one, two, three, very simple, very straightforward. And the only way it can be interpreted to mean anything else is if you are trying to read into it something that is not there. It is eisegesis of the most blatant kind. And mm -hmm. again, like you said earlier, not knocking the integrity of people who hold to this. I know no, there are not at all. people who hold to this. I do too. The logic itself, the, I, the, the, the thought process itself, is very uh, eisegetical. And yeah, I, I am not uh, knocking anybody that believes this personally. I know a lot of good people that, be, that adhere to this doctrine. I am just trying to lay out how scripturally it is not sound. It's not hermeneutically sound, right. and it is reading into the scriptures. It's nothing personal. Here's another scripture, Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. And it says here, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. This word knew and bare are the same words used in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Right. So w w what about verse, verse 25? Who, whose son is this? It's almost the exact same. It, it, it is almost word for word the exact same that we read in in the first verse of chapter 4. So we need to have a really darn good explanation as to why we're going to read 20, 25 differently from verse 1. Another thing uh, that I want to point out, I remember Pastor Peter saying this in one of his sermons, referring to this doctrine. And he, he made the point that having sex is like eating Lay's potato chips. You can't just do it one time. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be uh, a vulgar, or I'm just, you know, this is a very, very in-depth topic. If Satan can come down and have sexual relations with Eve this one time, what is stopping him from picking another woman and implanting his seed there? Right. Well, I mean... And, and he just That's had it one time, and now he's been celibate the last however many thousands of years? <laughs> exactly. If he has this habit of cohabiting with mortal women, then um, you'd think there would be a warning in Scripture somewhere. Like, hey, look out for this guy. You know, he, 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 you know, watch your wife. She has this habit of going after uh, fallen angels, and um, he, he could be lurking around any corner trying to jump her. Um, we don't see that anywhere in the Bible. No warning of that kind whatsoever. Um, and you'd think, like you said, you'd think he'd make a habit of this. If he did it once, he'll do it again, just like Adam. You know, this is his sin nature we're talking about. We're told over and over again, and to, and and it's and it's accurate that Adam's sin was not the only time that man has sinned because it's our sin nature that was being manifested there. So. Mm. Adam's sin nature, Eve's sin nature made manifest, so therefore there's Satan's sin nature being made manifest. So like you said, uh, we better look out. We better watch out. But there's no such warning, and that should be uh, interesting at the very least. This idea of, um, of angelic beings or cosmic god-like beings coming down and mating with women is very uh, Greco-Roman, um, Grecian style. You know, if you've ever looked into Greek mythology, uh, mm -hmm. gods like uh, uh, Zeus and uh, Poseidon, and um, they, they were always coming down and raping women and right. having their um, demigod offspring in the earth. That, I mean, if you read into the mythology, that, that was happening all the time. And uh, um, it, um, I believe this doctrine, that, it, and we, for those listening, I didn't want to dedicate two weeks to this, this topic on radio, but for those listening, there will be a follow-up webcast where Paul and I discuss 
some of the origins of this doctrine, or at least where it is showed up in history, that will drop right after this webcast on YouTube. So if you want to listen to that, we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. But um, this idea of these gods coming down and mating with women is very um, heathen religion. It comes from out of heathen religions, and we see that a lot. You can trace it all the way back to Babylon. Absolutely. Um, so Genesis 4, 1 and Genesis 4, 17 and 25, I think, seals the deal. You know, if, if there's something to this seed line doctrine, it cannot start here because it seems to be sealed right here. You know, we can't have Cain being the son of Satan, if it literally says it in the scriptures that Adam was his father, that Adam had sexual intercourse with Eve, and then she conceived and bare Cain. Uh, you can't have it any other way. Now, there is one argument that often comes up, and they'll say, well, Cain is not in any of Adam's genealogy, so therefore he is not his son. Now, that's probably one of the bigger arguments that I've heard on this. I've heard that multiple times. Yes, I have too. And to that, I would say, if you look at biblical genealogy, there's a lot of people that didn't show up. It's usually a straight line. Right. You know, it follows you know, the inheritance. Exactly. So um, look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. It's not a tree. It's more of a straight line going back to everyone that was significant in that line of genealogy. Well, it's interesting yeah. you should mention a straight line. I mean, that's the, both the words lineage and race both refer to a straight line. Exactly. And so I've heard that proposed to me many times, but I don't see how that really is a good argument because especially when you hear, uh, for example, daughters. You know, I don't know how many times in the Bible daughters are not listed in genealogy. Right, Exactly. How do we know that Satan or some other fallen angel did not mate with one of them and their seed get corrupted in another line? Now, I'm just being totally speculative at this point, but I mean, once again, what is stopping Satan from mating with these other women? And then not someone not being listed in genealogy it isn't a good argument. It's the line of secession and the inheritance that matters. And Cain wasn't part of that. He was disowned, you could say. Right. I think you could probably say the same for uh, Ishmael or, or Esau. Um, yeah. They're they're spoken of in very much the same way that Cain was, not because they were of some sort of satanic descent, but because they just were not of that lineage that carried on the family name, so to speak. Well, I, I am the God. I'm, I'm, I, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't he mention Ishmael and Enoch? Or not Enoch, but Ishmael and Esau. Um, right. They, you know, e Ishmael was of the Abrahamic line. He was Abraham's firstborn. Right. Enoch, not Enoch, but Esau, contrary to popular belief, was a full-blooded Hebrew. He was. He was a full-blooded Hebrew. He. <sighs> And we could get into a whole thing on that, but we don't have time. We've got about uh, five minutes uh, before we uh, have to close this radio program. But if you want right. to hear more on this subject, uh, Paul and I are going to have, uh, I guess, an after-show uh, uh, podcast that's going to drop at the same time on YouTube. But before we close out, Paul, do you want to share anything else before we end this program? I knew this program was going to go by quickly because there's just so much to cover. Yeah, there, it's hard. It's it's hard to keep everything contained and not go off into uh, these these big rabbit trails. Um, one of the things that's brought up, I thought might be fun to discuss a little bit, is in Genesis four we read about how Cain's sacrifice was rejected while Abel's yes. was accepted, and very often we're told that Cain's sacrifice was accepted or was was rejected because he was of Satan, that he was of a satanic mm -hmm. um, bloodline. But uh, there's a big problem with that because God has this very fatherly talk with him um, in verses uh, 6 and 7, saying, hey, look, all you got to do is do the right thing and you'll be fine. Now, 
if Cain was cursed simply because Satan was his dad, God would not be having this conversation with him. No matter what Cain did, he would be of a rejected, corrupted, satanic seed line. And um, God would not have bothered to, to do this. Cain was in his own way, it seems, trying to get God's acceptance, but he wasn't going about it the right way. Mm-hmm. And God has given him a little bit of a tutorial saying, hey, it's it, it, it's not it's not me. It's you. You got to you got to get your act together, buddy. You got to do things the right way. If you do well, he says, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. But you must master it. Well, according to the dual seed liners, Satan or sin was already the master of Cain. In fact, it was Cain was sin personified. Exactly. Um, so how why would God bother having this conversation with him if that were the case? Um, he had as equal a shot as Abel did. Very good point. He, he just missed out on it. So um, I think that's that's uh, another another thing that could be brought up if we're going to be sticking just in this chapter. There's so much more we could talk about in Matthew and John and all these other places where uh, they they like to point, but. Well, for those listening, I want to recommend two books before we close out. Okay. And, bo- and both of them you can read online for free. And uh, the first one is, is what about the seed line doctrine? A biblical explanation and uh, examination and explanation of the Cain satanic seed line doctrine by Charles A. Wiseman. I'll put it in the description below on YouTube. Another one is Eve. Did she or didn't she? The seed line hypothesis under scrutiny by Ted R. Wyland. Um, you can read that on his website for free at missiontoisrael.org. Uh, those are two two books, both of those Anglo-Israel authors and both opposing the doctrine. Um, there's also some sermons and some other um, information I will post in the description below. But for now, you've been listening to Christian America Ministries. I've had uh, my, as my guest uh, Paul Matergene. Be sure to check out his YouTube channel, Tearing Down Idols, uh, here on YouTube. And um, if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about this, come on over to uh, Christian American Ministries' YouTube channel and right after the broadcast, and we will be discussing a little bit more into the origins of this and where it's cropped up in history. Till next week, you've been listening to Christian American Ministries, uh, broadcasting worldwide on shortwave radio. Thank you. You have been listening to Christian American Ministries worldwide, broadcasting on shortwave radio and over the internet at kingdomradioonline.com. If you enjoy these broadcasts, please reach out and let us know. We would like to hear from you at www.christianamericaministries.org. And also give us some ideas and suggestions for topics to cover in upcoming broadcast, as well as some possible guests to have on the program to discuss those topics. Also, let us know where and how you are listening in the world. It would be a great help to get that feedback. Thank you. You have been listening to Christian America Ministries on shortwave radio broadcasting on frequency 7490. Come back next week at Friday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another broadcast. Christian America Ministries is dedicated to uncensored, politically incorrect biblical teaching. Christian America Ministries' main mission is to proclaim and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and His kingdom here on this earth and revealing to the Anglo-Saxon and kindred people their true biblical identity as God's covenant people, Israel, and their responsibility as Israel. If you would like to learn more about Christian America Ministries, you can visit our website, christianamericaministries.org, or check us out on YouTube and BitChute for our weekly videos. Thank you for listening to Christian America Ministries.